Hi guys, welcome back to the Astro Imaging Channel. Tonight's session, Easy as Pie, Picks Insight by Warren Keller. Warren, uh, known as the PI Guru, is on with us tonight. He's going to go into uh, some of the new features in Picks Insight and some of the old features in Picks Insight. Uh, or if you're not familiar with it, just kind of give you a general overview. Of course, Warren has uh, a website with a bunch of uh, series uh, on uh, learning basically Picks Insight one tool at a time. Uh, he has a book on Picks Insight, which uh, whether you uh, like to learn via videos or books, uh, one of them I would definitely recommend if you're starting out in PI. Um, and uh, he also runs live uh, uh, workshops, uh, one of which is upcoming in, I believe, Buffalo, New York. Um, so if you're interested in any of those, uh, the links to, I believe, all of them are in the description of this video. Uh, all that said, let me jump over and show off our image of the week. This week's image of the week is uh, goes to Nico Carver for his Spaghetti Nebula. Uh, object, uh, what is it? Is it Seamus or is it Seamus? I'm not quite sure. Seamus, Seamus, 147. Seamus? Yeah. Yeah. Um, it is a really cool nebula, pretty large object. Uh, with uh, an ASI 1600 camera and a Canon 200 millimeter lens. Uh, so I believe he got this without um, mosaic, excuse me, mosaicing it, uh, but a great image. So congrats, Nico Carver. Uh, if you guys want to submit your images of the week, just hover over that, click the image of the week submission. And uh, the way to submit is down here at the bottom. Uh, if you post it twice, no problems. I usually catch it. If not, you can send me an email, but, uh, I just delete them on the back end. If it doesn't show up on the back end, uh, excuse me, if it doesn't show up on the front end and you've submitted it a few times, I'm probably still seeing it on the back end for some reason. It's either not able to scale it or render it or something like that. I don't know, but, uh, I still pick from them. Okay. Um... I believe that's all I've got. Let me jump back over here and hand it right over to Warren. Warren, the, the camera's yours. All right, thanks uh, so much for that. Uh, those kind words, Adam. Hi, everybody, good to see you. Uh, good to hear you. I'm hiding, uh, no cam no cam over here, so I'm, I'm hiding. Hopefully you can see my screen, though. Um, so yeah, we're, we're doing our first live workshop and um, Adam was kind enough to, to mention that in Buffalo, New York and that's because our beloved Pete Pru, um, our uh, web guru and uh, half of IP4AP.com uh, is in Buffalo so it was just easy for us to uh, you know to um, as far as logistics to do it uh, right in his hometown. I'll be joined by Dr. Ron Breacher, my buddy Ron, who has been a technical reviewer for the for the book, both both on the first edition as well as now uh, on the second. And uh, he started out like many of uh, you guys out there, a customer, a client, um, very bright guy, toxicologist by by uh, by trade became uh, a very good imager and really has a passion for teaching both professionally and and well professionally in astrophotography now as well as uh, you know his his day gig and so you know, he and i really become a good team i think we complement each other and we work a, a room really well together we did uh caps the canadian astrophotography school i guess uh uh, two years ago, um, and we did uh, advanced imaging conference together. And again, just you know, really play off each other well, I think. And I and I and I, you know, his his mathematical strengths in areas that I'm not all that strong. Anyway, we're we're putting together this three day workshop. We'd love to have you join us. We've got uh, 21 people signed up right now. I think we'll go up to 30. I think Handle 30, kindly sponsored by my good friend Steve Bisk and crew, uh, Guilain Rochon. I love that name. I'd like say that. Uh, o Telescope, Canada's top tier telescopes and accessories, and my former 
uh, employers and uh, and uh, compatriots, Steve uh, Chambers and Rui, Rui, I like saying that too, uh, at, at Attic Cameras. And uh, so University of Buffalo Center for Tomorrow, and Adam said uh, he sent the link. So if you just go to ip 4 com even, uh, right on the on the home page, you'll you'll see the workshop. Love to have you. Uh, we're gonna feed you. We're gonna have a barbecue. Basically, three days, eighteen hours of training, uh, five hundred and ninety five dollars, which I think is uh, is really reasonable. Some pretty inexpensive uh, hotels in the area too. Any questions or comments on on that? We're gonna. Uh, we've got a little bit of agenda here. We're basically gonna try to cover everything. I mean, you know, as my good friend Richard Wright from uh, Software Bisque says, you know, it's a situation of a bit like K through 12, right? Kindergarten through uh, through senior year of high school. You never know exactly what you're going to get. We have done a couple of surveys and we kind of know who we're talking to, but we do have, you know, some beginners and some uh, advanced folks. And so we're going to try to mix that up. Uh, Adam used that phrase, easy as pie, something that my uh, former Nashville songwriter brain uh, came up with, uh, always looking for those hooks, you know? Uh, easy as pie because because in my thinking at that point was you know there really is a very not very but a rather simple uh, painless track that one can take to get pretty darn good imagers I mean some of us obsess to the point of you know insanity and you can dig deeper and deeper with this program as you can with all astro image processing and packages but the, but there is but there is an easy path and we want to make sure we get that out. Uh, that first morning and then move on to more advanced concepts of pre-processing, post-processing, um, and all the way into some special techniques of narrow band and mosaic building and all of that. A lot to cover. We'll see how it goes. We're certainly going to try to keep on track, um, but uh, you know how that goes, right? <laughs> so uh, again, any questions or, um, or comments uh, with regard to the uh, to the workshop, May 4th, 5th, and 6th in Buffalo. Don't forget the chicken wings. All right, so I guess I'll close that. And um, let's see what other kinds of commercials. Uh, if you're not currently subscribed to, uh, to IP4AP.com, love to have you. Uh, as many of you know, uh, we have Fixed to Site Foundations that I did with Rogelio Bernal Andreo, um, our first foray into the uh, foray, not fray, <laughs> into the program. Part one, two, and three, we did over three years, and it's, you know, it's got everything. I mean, some of this stuff has been changed, uh, added, improved, but the, the essence of all of this stuff still stands. Uh, a lot of good practices and certainly not, uh, not something to be uh, pitched at this point, but uh, a couple of years ago started on PI Reloaded uh, series, which uh, now probably over uh, 40 uh, tutorials and also uh, live uh, podcasts that we've done amongst ourselves and with a few other people that we've broken up into several parts. But uh, this is kind of the glue. This is, uh, you know, what, uh, what pulls everything together, updates the earlier series, um, the latest and greatest scripts. We can look at the advanced star mask script games, but these are movies I've already done. And, you know, we always try to keep these modules uh, between a minute, five, six minutes, very digestible, uh, latest information, always try to be as accurate as, as possible. Any, any uh, questions on the, on the video series? And um, home, we've got the shop. And uh, the book, and again, you know, uh, I was very proud of the first mission. I think we did a really good job on it, but I've learned a heck of a lot more, you know, and I've gone much, much deeper into things. And like I said it uh, earlier to some of the guys, it, it never stops. It's a very dynamic program, right? Uh, it's constantly being... Um, being uh, amended and changed, improved, and we try to keep up with that. Um, but uh, we can see that although one says there'll never be a Pixel Site 2.0, uh, there's going to be a heck of a lot of 1.8.5 revisions, uh, just new stuff coming down the down the pike constantly. Some reviews, some good stuff at, 
Amazon reviews. Um, and so, uh, you know, um, appreciate your support on this. And when the second edition is ready, uh, I, I honestly think everybody uh, that's still uh, in learning and still interested in being as current as possible um, needs to have that second edition because it's going to be uh, much, much, much deeper. And, and yet we all know, you know, going on the forum, on, on Pixel Site Forum on any given day, uh, constant, constant changes, constant new stuff. So it really is very hard to, hard to keep up. Um, and that's kind of my job, right? Um, as a user, as a processor, you know, I think we try to find a path that works for us to the degree of complexity that we're willing to take on uh, to get the best possible result. And, and truth be told, again, you can get really good results uh, with pretty simplistic uh, comparatively uh, workflows. Um, but, but again, as a teacher, uh, I'm compelled to try to uh, keep on top of of everything, right? So we were talking uh, right before uh, airtime, if no one has any questions right now, um, about a couple of new changes. I was on a vacation <laughs> for uh, a month and came back to a lot of new stuff and uh, trying to catch up on the, on the book review and everything. So uh, I apologize. I don't really have data demonstrations for you here, but just like to chat about some stuff. One, one big addition that's not been included uh, in, in an official release yet, but will be in the next one is for you DSLR shooters. Um, changes to the old DC raw David Coffin uh, module here in the Format Explorer. And um, this is basically uh, lib, lib raw, um, mostly Juan uh, Caniero's uh, implementation, uh, but with uh, some new um, demosaicing uh, interpolation algorithms from some uh, some Linux folks and uh, a very sophisticated uh, noise reduction uh, routine uh, for for DSLR now um, it's also simplified there's there's uh, actually less controls than there are in the in the in the uh, old version but again for you DSLR folks pure raw really is the way to go um, it's fine to demosaic or debayer uh, color images on the fly for inspection, but uh, best to use the tools available to us for astronomical purposes and to stick with this pure raw setting so that no uh, color conversion occurs. And that's so we can calibrate and we can, um, um, oh, it's, um, I'm sorry, um, cosmetically correct the image before we color convert, right? And, but some of these things are going to be seen, I was just saying to the guys in, in the debayer process. So for those of us using one shot color CCD um, or one shot color MOS, um, we're generally dealing with the debayer module, whether it's being used in batch now, um, which it now supports batch, or it's being used in the background of the batch processing script, uh, we're going to see some changes here, too. We're going to see some of those uh, interpolation algorithms added here, uh, the noise reduction for DSLR to be enacted or, or to be disabled if we're not doing that. Uh, very recently, he added an auto setting to detect the bare pattern of a DSLR camera. And again, for those of us using astronomical cameras, we still need to determine what those bare offsets are uh, before we really do anything. And also sounds like he's going to rename the module from DeBayer to uh, something new because uh, I was just mentioning to the guys, there's apparently a new, fairly new kid on the block. Uh, called uh, the X-Trans um, uh, sensor from Fujifilm. And so it's based on a Bayer matrix. I think it still owes, a, a, you know, a doff of the hat to Dr. Bryce Bayer of Kodak, but it's a different architecture. And so as these new uh, type of sensors, which are CFAs, culture, color filter arrays, but, but technically not a Bayer, Bayer filter anymore. So... Um, 
so it makes sense to uh, to rename uh, the module. Um, Warren, uh, one question that you've already got. Uh, can you lock the process console to always be on raw format tab so you don't forget when signing on? And I'm not, I'm not quite sure where exactly he's referring to. Say that in, Adam. Do I see that? Can I see that? Or, or you uh, that's, in, that? Uh, that's in the chat, which is on our website. Uh, let me try and share that window with you. He well, um, I clicked. I clicked that chat button. Um, it is in and, there. You, you can pop it out so you can view it. Uh, right. So again, let me see if I can let translate me just, that. Let me do it this way. Morgan, uh, do you um are are you talking about the process console or yeah? Are you talking about the process console or the um um batch preprocessing script? Yeah, the, the tab he's showing now, which I'm assuming is the one on the left side. Uh, under all right, so that's so that's the format explorer, right? And I never use that except for those initial settings that I want to do to fit or uh, raw whatever we're doing. And then once you, once that's done, you know, you can close that out and you can recall it anytime. I think what uh, what I is talking about is the process console itself, which is here. And he says, can you? lock the process to always be on raw format tab. They say that doesn't make any sense to me. Um, I don't think he's asking about the process console. He's asking about the tab that you are now showing. The one that says image integration or the, the over in the left hand corner, he's got the process console up. When you close the program, it resets to BPM. Uh, bitmap. What what resets to bitmap? Um, I think it was that that, uh, that when you open up the format explorer, it defaults to highlighting the BPM. But that's just a list. You can click on anything in there. It's not defaulting to anything in particular. Right. It doesn't change any setting anywhere. Right. It's right. Not Right, right, and yeah, right, and again, you know, you got to double click these to open these and to do what you need to do and save the changes, and then you can tuck this away or you can close it. It's not something that I ever interface with, and as some of you folks know, as I've mentioned, I'm a bit OCD and very minimalistic, so I like a very clean, organized workspace. And don't live like me. Don't be like me, please. But as you can see, I've got my my little process icons all perfectly lined up on that edge. And I, you know, I've only got the History Explorer open at any one time. I've got my, uh, I've got the toolbars that I like open that I need access to most of the time in, a, again, a minimal sort of way. Anything that's redundant, I don't want and I don't need. I like to pay attention to, you know, the canvas, if you will, and, and keep it as simple as possible. The process console, you know, that's our buddy, right? We've, there's not much we can do about it. We can delay its appearance, uh, but we can't close it. And, and most of us find that it's so useful that we really don't want to. Uh, close it, but you can move those around. You can stick them open, close, and of course we run through those in the free, uh, what we call the 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 four or five. I'm sorry, primer chapters that are available free at ip4ap.com. Just you know how to navigate in here, how to make things a little bit bit easier. Okay, so there, there's that. Anything else there? Okay. One thing I wanted to talk about was image integrations, rather new large scale pixel rejection. Um, gotten to play with it a little bit, and it's pretty much what it sounds like. Um, you know, despite you know guys like Dave out there, David Alt, and uh, you know, some very mathematically minded uh, people in the community thankful for them you know they understand a lot of what's going on behind the scenes for most of most of us um you know we we have seen i think in in practical purposes that even though uh we have a ton of um 
choices available for um, rejection algorithms that PI always seem to be a bit weak in rejecting larger scale um, outlier pixels. So you dial your, your Sigma rejection settings in nicely and you'd have a beautiful image taking care of all of your normal artifacts. But then if you had that airplane or satellite trail uh, in an otherwise good image, um, it seemed to be really sticky, uh, at least in my experience. And feel free to you know second that or, or, or tell me I'm a fool. Um, but you know, you'd have that one or two images, even in a data set as big as 30, uh, you know, subframes. And that satellite, that, those trails, those high-sided outliers, really, really difficult to get rid of unless you dialed your, you know, your sigma rejection settings uh, way, way down. And then you were sacrificing a lot of data. So, you know, they never really came out and said, okay, yeah, we, <laughs> we messed up or, or, or there's something lacking in the algorithms or whatever it is. Uh, but they instituted large scale pixel rejection because now when we, when we enact these, uh, we're looking at these artifacts, not as single pixels, but larger, uh, larger scale stuff, groupings of problematic pixels, right? So if it's a high side, a bright, object we would enable this if it's a low uh thing this could have some help for us in uh in some even dust motes perhaps Reje uh, reject low reject high and then playing with the uh, rejection settings somewhat and so when that's enabled the idea is then you can be a lot more let me just change this from percentile i was i was um you know, you could be a lot more lenient with your sigma high uh, slider, you know, keeping as much data as possible, being lenient, so the rejection is, is much more tolerant because of this. There's also the new um, local normalization, which is kind of interesting. Uh, you know, Juan keeps promising a tutorial on this, um, and he's termed it as dangerous, quote, unquote. Uh, in the forum if you guys have seen that. So misuse of local normalization uh, is deemed dangerous by its creator. It's a lie, it's a lie. Um, but, but it's another, um, yet another step that we can try because, um, you know, the normalization that goes on in image integration The normalization that goes on here, you know, is um, is kind of just by comparison to the reference image, right? It doesn't really look at gradients and uh, smaller scale types of variation in brightness and such. And so that's what that's what local normalization is desi is designed to do. And if you look closely, you know, you see the same kinds of things, you know, looking for, for an ideal reference image. Um, let's see. Uh, it's actually supposed to take care of some of the large and small scale problems, which would then make uh, image integrations job and even that um, large scale pixel rejection business, it's task easier. Uh, but again, you know, there are many users out there that are going to stick with the good old BPP batch preprocessing script because they're not willing to go through four separate modules to calibrate um, if, if, it, if it's uh, the case for their camera, debayer, uh, then register align, star align the images and integrate. And, 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 and the bottom line is there's some very accomplished imagers, Ron Breacher in, uh, included, who are satisfied with the results of the, of the BPP. Um, and so, you know, with, with the advent now of local normalization, I mean, and if you're doing one shot color, now we're talking about, you know, six different uh, modules uh, to get master files uh, assembled. And that's, for some people, that's, that's a lot of work. For some folks, it's, it's too much work. So again, there is an easy as pie uh, track to take. And in many cases, uh, the good old 
batch pre-processing script will get the job done. Now, you know, the tutorials, the book, it will tell you that there are several limitations to it. Um, but again, in most cases, it works well. And you can also choose to calibrate only to speed things along. You can choose uh, to calibrate and register or align your images, but not actually integrate them into master frames. And you can do that uh, in uh, image integration over here. Uh, so there's a lot of different ways to go. And, and as a result, of course, there's a lot of confusion. Uh, again, you know, getting back from uh, being away for a while and jumping back on the forum last night and today, oh my gosh, you know, I mean, you want that to be an active place for people to participate and ask questions, but it just struck me that there was a whole wave of new users who don't know what an archive is and apparently don't know that there's some really good resources out there in cyberspace and just asking, you know, those very basic questions of just running into um, problems that, you know, will be insurmountable from the get-go if you don't understand uh, what you're doing. So it's nice to be able to rely on some good, some good resources. Uh, so we, we talked a little bit about uh, image integrations, uh, large-scale pixel projection, and uh, local normalization. Uh, another real biggie is uh, PCC, right? The addition of photometric color calibration as opposed to the, uh, the older um, color, 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 let's just do this. Um, oh, my gosh. Sorry. Lauren, can I interrupt you while you're looking yeah, at Yeah, please. Um, please. What um, of the um, new processes and, and uh, scripts and things like that that came out over the last few months, including two or three of them, like you've just reviewed in the one you're about to review, how many of those have already been covered in tutorials on your website? Most. Most. Um, so, yeah. Let, let me just, if you don't mind, let me just from, from, my own, from my own self, let me just pull this up a second and uh, slide over to, that's what I want. Why is it, why is it always Facebook? <laughs> it's everywhere. Um, PI reloaded. So let me just drag this over here. So I just did uh, these two new scripts and um, a couple of oldies but goodies that I hadn't covered before, Mosaic Planner, Image Solver, Annotate scripts. But uh, let's see. Uh, yeah, a, lo a lot of them have, have been covered. Uh, Large-scale pixel rejection here, local normalization, photometric color calibration. Yeah, but again, you know, I no sooner finished these and... <laughs> Uh, something something's changed and updated. So what do we do? We go back and we do another movie, or we tweak the tweak the old one if we can. Um, I, I your print's really hard to read by the time it gets here. Morgan Dollar is asking: Is there a tutorial on photometric color color? Well, you're about to do one. Uh, have you done one already well, over on the website? Well, Mor Morgan, yes. Uh, if you go to that. Uh, if you go to that page, if you go to the ip4ap.com website and just go to the uh, PI Reloaded and the new Pixel Site tutorials that we're on now and in version 1.8.5 updates and right here, photometric color calibration. Now, in order for Morgan to get there, though, doesn't he have to uh, be a member or you know, subscription? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, you'll subscribe. Uh, Morgan, three nine three ninety. Um, I don't want to shoot myself in the foot now. I know we raised our price. I think we're at four ninety nine a month. There it is. Subscribe today. You can cancel at any time. Um, it's a veritable smorgasbord of uh, older Photoshop material, PixInsight, even some AstroArt and uh, Maxim DL um, five point oh. Lots of good stuff there. So, you know, you'd you'd want to start probably with the foundations. And again, understanding that they're very uh, comprehensive, but they're older, right? Because they were begun, begun 2012, 2013, 2014. Um, and so the latest and greatest stuff would be on this reloaded 
uh, but but these are sort of fill-ins, updates, corrections, new stuff. Uh, so it's still good to have that that foundation uh, with the with the tutorials. Makes sense. Anybody else? So, you know, there's now two calibration tools. There's good old color calibration, which I thought was wonderful and masterful. Uh, now there's photometric color calibration. And so they feel like these two tools are not complementary in the sense that they would be used uh, in conjunction with one another because you would not do that. Uh, but two different approaches, and they get very heavy into the philosophy of, you know, what is true color and astrophotography and all of this stuff. And I don't, I don't, look, I'm very big on color and correct color, quote unquote, uh, and a real stickler for it. And I work that very hard. But by the same token, I don't get so caught up in this philosophy. I mean, to me, if I take a DSLR, um, you know, and I take a picture of uh, my dog <laughs> outside, and there's Jack. He's black, his collar's red, and, and uh, the grass is green and the whole thing. And if I point that same uh, camera up to the skies, um, and then, of course, we probably want to have it modified, so we're letting in some of the, the near-infrared, right? But, but, but we put it on a bright object, and lo and behold, there's M42 in all its glory. It's red, it's mauve, it's pink, it's uh, the running man, it's this gorgeous magenta and purple. So to me, color's real, it's there, that's it. Um, and so I, I, I don't understand sometimes uh, where, where people go with it, but, but the way it's explained now is that color calibration uh, would continue to be used if you want to use the image itself as the white, reference and that's been really good but it's been sort of a best guess sort of thing uh color calibration didn't know what the stars were what their spectral class were what their names were but it but it knew but it could set a white re, uh, you know a white balance based on the stars that it saw within the image and as it's explained there in the forum by Vicente, uh well he, he I don't know that he said he goes out and says it, but if you've got a, an image that's let's say we lost you, Warren. I lost you. I'm here. Can you hear me? I can hear you now. Okay, we lost Warren then. To, to the world. And it does place you're, you're, Warren, you've stopped the image. image. Warren, we lost your screen yeah. share for a sec. I'm okay. not quite sure why. Yeah. I can still um, hear your voice. Yeah, maybe well, that's good. It says, it says you are screen sharing. Uh, maybe just a drop off in bandwidth or. Yeah, try uh, unsharing your screen by clicking that green box again and then uh, re screen share. And hopefully that'll bring it back. But I still think the badger's cute. Yeah, he is. Dr. Snuggles, um, the voice of uh, Peter Ustinov, Ustinov. Uh, great, great cartoon. Is it back? Still don't see the image. Hmm. Mm. Yeah, on this end, it tells me that I am screen sharing. Yeah, and I can see the arrow that, on my end, that you're trying to screen share. I don't know if it's a bandwidth mm -hmm. issue or what. Mm -hmm. uh, well, if somebody or, wanted, Adam yes. or, I'll pull or it up. Alex, if you want to pull, if you want to pull up a photometric color calibration in the meantime. Uh, okay, okay. You're, Adam, you're doing that? Yes, I got um, it. And share, uh, Adam, share your Adam, click on click on Warren's. Uh, but no, no, Warren's. We're seeing Warren uh, his um, uh, avatar. We're just not seeing your screen share. Yeah, mm -hmm. I don't know why. It might be bandwidth or something like that. But you should see you should see my Pix Insight screen now. So what I'll do is I will open up the new 
uh, photometric color calibration tool right there. Warren, I don't know okay. if you can see my screen, if that helps you. Yeah, I, ca I can. And I'm going to, if I can, I'm going to, I'm going to try, I'm going to stop sharing mine for a bit if I can. Yeah. Well, it does, yeah. Oh, you went away. Um, the astro imaging channel. There we go. So, so up top there, right? So we're using an outside white reference. No, notice ASG, average spiral galaxy, and this goes back to the sense uh, original publications for the old color calibration when he when he's basically saying look you know an average spiral galaxy that's much more exacting than that right it's a it, it's a it's it's a spiral galaxy that's face on it's at a, a particular distance away a particular um, you know angulation and all of that kind of thing but in theory uh, that provides the perfect white reference right because we've got everything from uh, golden cores to older blue stars in the spiral arms to star forming regions of you know pinkish H2 and and so it provides everything in the spectrum and so that doesn't have to be obviously in the image but that's our standard that's our white reference and as I mentioned before that database server you see there you can change for something that's close to your home um, or, or just works better for you, but it's calling out to the internet. It's using one of uh, Del Pozo's uh, scripts to actually plate solve the image. So now it knows, after a successful plate solve, it knows what these stars actually are in the image and knows what their spectral class is and can therefore make a very accurate adjustment to the white balance. Uh, you'll notice toward the bottom there says background neutralization. You no longer have to do a separate background neutralization with the background neutralization process before you get to color calibration or afterward because it's built into the module. And so to my way of thinking, PCC is always, it's longer, it's a little bit more work, but it's always going to better uh, the color calibration result. And so I'm going to stick with it unless, again, in those rare instances, if, if an image is very biased, uh, flooded with extended nebulosity and the stars uh, that are going to provide the, the white reference are obscured by that dust, uh, then correcting for the stars could uh, really do damage to eliminating that extended nebulosity. So keep CC in your back pocket, but uh, perhaps consider joining me and using PCC as the, the main line way to calibrate uh, color. So those, those are kind of the main things I want to talk about. I, I wanted to show you these scripts. There's a, a German fellow named Hart, um, Hartmut uh, Bornemann and um, and an, an Austrian friend of his, Herbert Walter, that have a repository that you can add, uh, or you can now get the scripts individually. And again, I'm minimalistic, so I'd rather just have the scripts that I'm interested in and load them. And uh, the two are uh, Advanced Star Mask and also uh, Game. Uh, game is a kind of a bizarre name. Uh, but it's the, supposed to be the interactive galaxy mask editor. This is uh, this is revolutionary. I mean, you know, if you guys have my first book, uh, having to put in all of those pixel uh, pixel math formulas to create round or oval ellipsoidal shapes. Um, oh, so I'm not sharing my screen. I forgot about that. Um, that's a bummer. Let me try to share this again. Let's try it again. I think our bandwidth is yeah. back up. So. There. Hmm. Well, that's a major bummer.
guess it's not coming back at him, huh? Yeah, I don't quite know why. Well, at any rate, be sure to look into uh, the tutorial I did on the GAME game script or look on the forum for discussion from, uh, again, Herbert Walter, um, a script by Hartmut Bornemann. I mean, this thing's unbelievable. It's, uh, man, you can create a, a mask in, in lickety split. And uh, by the way, I was told uh, our friend Adam Block is actually behind the pixel math formula uh, that Hartmut used. But it'll kick out um, five very useful masks. And so no more painful painting and, uh, and, and, and pixel math expressions. You can create uh, a mask uh, on the fly very easily. So I think that's just a terrific addition to Pix Insight. And that's really, you know, for those of you who have been with me a while, that's that's really my one and only uh, issue with with Pix Insight is uh, is masking uh, as compared to Photoshop, you know, having been in Photoshop for 13, 14 years and being used to the ease of, of, of painting, creating a mask, black, white, gray uh, very easily and so I philosophically I get you know why PI doesn't like to go there um, but at, at the end of the day it's also a little bit it's a little bit arbitrary on their point right you know they let us uh, do a nonlinear uh, conversion and do lots of cool things to the image but then they have these very fixed philosophical um, you know things that they are against and so I think this is uh, this is great. And the same cat uh, Hartmut, uh, you'll also find available again on the on the forum. Or if you search Herbert Walter um, astrophotography, um, I'm sure you'll find it. Uh, he's got this. Um, and we apologize for the for the screen share. It's ADV, uh, Advanced Star Mask. And for those of you who are a little less comfortable uh, with the star mask process itself, uh, this creates a very credible, basic star mask uh, at a single click. Uh, so that's that is another great addition. So lots of good stuff coming coming down. Warren, we've got some questions coming in over on the Astro Imaging channel. There's, yeah. a, there's a way to get the um, – there, there are two chat sessions going on. One is for the people that are only in the room, and the other one's for everybody mm -hmm. that's listening. And there are about, what, 35 last I checked. There are 30 mm -hmm. speakers right now. Mm -hmm. Okay. At any rate, uh, let me read through some of them. Um, uh, Morgan Dollar is asked, is there a tutorial on photometric color calibration? Uh, and I don't remember, is that already on the website? Yeah, yeah, that one, that one we answered. Okay. Yes, um, it is. And George uh, has asked, I've, a I've watched the One Shot Color uh, program workshop. Is there a plan to come up with an updated version of this with more details? The One Shot color workshop um so so our live thing yeah i i'm sure that again uh, we've talked tonight about uh, the bayer module changing mm -hmm. and um and the dslr raw module so yeah sure we'll do another uh, another okay. one at some point uh mike witt uh, a little later on down there says uh any hints on the plate solving uh, what uh have you used plate solving enough to know its quirks and and can you give us some hints, hints as to what to do with it? He continues, he's tried this process and it always fails the plate solving. I know others have I've seen it and are having issues with it. Right. So, um, one, one thing I remember is uh, disengaging the automatic limit magnitude under the plate solving parameters and bumping up the limit magnitude to, let's say, 16 or 18. Um, I, that would be the first line of offense to get it to go. And of course, uh, you know, you've got to give it an accurate focal length, uh, pixel size. Remember that if you're binning 
Um, your pixel size is going to be different from its physical architecture, and you may have to change that as well. Um, but other than that, I've had really good success with, uh, with successful plate solves. Hey, Warren, I'll, uh, I'll add one now thing. Here, now, let me, let me just say this before I forget, and, and this is in the tutorial and in the book too. You know, under image parameters up top, you can acquire from image, right? So you're not going to be able to get those coordinates from um, your master file, but you can get it as long as your, your acquisition software is writing coordinates to the FITS header. You can simply open a single subframe, click Acquire from Image, get your coordinates, and then apply this to your Chrome and its master. Yeah, that's. I tried to demonstrate that when I had it open, and that's been the key for me. Is uh, you have to remember, don't do it on the master, do it on the right. sub. Right. Assuming all of your uh, uh, parameters are set in your acquisition program, which they should be because it makes life so much easier. Right. Hey, hey, Adam Warren, I, yes. I have one other thing I can add to that. Go which ahead. Is that, um, I've worked with several people's data that they had problems with the, the plate solving in there. And generally what I did was I, I would go and use the image solver directly. Yes, I would, I would pull the image data from their, uh, you know, one of their subs uh, if they had it in there um, as a seed. But then I would work with the image solver until I got it to solve because it's a little more flexible than the solver uh, parameters that are available in uh, mm -hmm. the metric color calibrator. And cool. then, you know, once you save everything in there through the image solver, it's, it's added to the FITS header. So you can just disable the, or, you know, make sure the force uh, the plate solve is turned off and then it will just pull all the information from there. Great. Can you use that to color calibration? Um, both with linear and with stretched images? Well, you know, of course, pixel site methodology is going to be to do this in the linear. Um, there's no reason it's not going to make some correction to a, to a nonlinear image. But again, workflow would, would, would dictate uh, doing this in the, in the linear. OK. Let's see. Let's look through these questions here. Which is better to use for reversed lights? I'm getting geometry errors and batch processing that I wasn't getting before. Reversed, reversed lights. I don't know what that means. CJ, aren't you in the room someplace? No, I guess you're not in there today. I think he means like when they're uh, mirror imaged, but I don't know what causes that. I, I, okay. or, uh, so so say it again then. So he said, "Oh, look, well, okay." Assuming which that is better for reversed lights? I'm getting geometry and batch pre-processing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, he's definitely talking about about a problem he's having when he's getting lights from the east and from the west. Where you know oh. when he. It doesn't oh, already oh, 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 oh. Okay. Um, oh. Well, a, cu a couple of things there. In batch preprocessing, you can create custom groups with the add custom feature. And mm -hmm. for instance, name one set, you know, east lights, and then your flats, east flats and vice versa, west lights, west flats, and the script is then capable of looking at them as separate groups and applying the eastern flats to the eastern lights and you know western flats to western lights. So, so that's one thing. Uh, we also might be talking about uh, registration failures uh, because the images are flipped and um, Make sure that the triangular triangle similar sim, similarity is is checked in uh, in the registration section. 
me just oh, look okay, at well, that. Warren, okay. Warren, we're specifically, CJ specifically asking about geometry errors. Aren't geometry errors meaning that you've got two different sizes of pictures? Well, yes, Alex, that's that's probably even truer. Yeah, for some reason, it's it, it's seeing uh, exactly what Alex says, that they're not the same size. Yeah, if they're not 2242 by 3600, you know, one is that and one is not. Right. Um, were they acquired in the same program? Sometimes uh, programs acquire and then they clip right. the edges off and things like that. Did you, you know, did you bin? Did you bin color and are you forgetting putting, you know, unbinned with binned uh, images? So there's a few possibilities there. Also, if you have a DSLR that has the auto rotation frames, um, and you're not in pure raw mode, uh, it will rotate the image as you go near the uh, meridian, depending on what angle you're at. Mm -hmm. All good stuff. Thanks. Um, uh, you, CJ, you know, what you need to do is call up your flat or call up any place where you're having a, uh, a geometry error and check to see what your geometry really is. Do you have the same number of pixels up and down and horizontally? Vertical and horizontal, same number of pictures in both images that you're trying to work with. Right, right. Now, for me, you know, with the script, we talked about limitations, and 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 yet it, it being very capable in most cases. I, I will tell you that for me, uh, the script's always a problem because when I when I'm processing very high resolution data, uh, I have very relatively few stars um, and so as good as star alignment is it's the truncated version of star alignment used by the script uh, that I often get uh, registration failures can't find enough matching pairs and so for me the script if I'm going to use it it's just going to be to do the calibration and then I'm going to go align separately and of course always integrate separately uh, but as i'm sure many of you have noticed it, to me the script works in a bit of an odd sequence uh, where if you start getting registration failures uh, you won't get all your data calibrated either and it kind of stops in the middle in an annoying point where you can't quite be sure what got finished and what didn't so i'll just typically not not use it beyond um, calibration but don't let me scare you it's it's very capable for most folks it can handle most data and do a fine job of it okay Warren another question Mike Witt has asked uh, have you any thought on doing a pixel math tutorial on your website you know it's it's probably suicide for a person um, in the position of being a teacher to say this, but I'll say it, it's out of my wheelhouse. Um, there's a lot of pixel math expressions in the first book. There's more in the second book. Um, I've worked through that with uh, people that speak the language of math uh, much more fluently than I do. Um, I would certainly entertain having Ron or Dave uh, do a special for us if they were interested, uh, but for me, uh, I try to uh, I try to uh, you know get the most I can out of the out of the scripts and the processes because again, uh, pixel math is not uh, a natural place that I that I'm comfortable in, and so it it would be my the weak link in the chain of what I'm able to teach. Um, the questions that are popping up based on that. Um, all I would say is what helped me with pixel math was to actually uh, look at the Photoshop uh, blending modes and see what the math is behind them. There are a few websites that'll show that. So you can see like the math behind min, uh, minimum uh, yep. or maximum. So light right. or dark and it, it gives you just right. a little bit of an idea. Right, and some of that also, Adam, is available at uh, Gerald Westselberger mm -hmm. uh, Austrian site, and also I think uh, the um, the Argentinian Pixinsight resources. Alejandro Tombolini's got some uh, 
some icon sets with uh, with the blend modes as well. Yeah, I mean, for most of us, you know, uh, addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, the basic, uh, the basic functions can get us really far in pixel math. I pick up what I can from people I admire and use their expressions and with permission share those, uh, David included. Um, but again, it's, uh, it's not exactly where I live. <laughs> What else? Um, we do have one person earlier, Chris Mc, Mc, Chris something like that, Mc, Mc, Lawhorn or McIhorn. Uh, I need an episode on how, how to collimate an RC right now. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's not tonight's show for sure. And right. I, you know, I've never had to collimate my thank goodness. Um, right. But they uh, still, they yeah, still well, use the, the Takahashi RC scope. Yeah. Um, <laughs> You can uh, you can scour YouTube for that one, and and just be careful of people that go um, and oh, did I forget to mention? <laughs> yeah. At any rate, uh, we'll we'll just put that on our list of things if we can find somebody. For anybody's out there, remember we are always looking for presenters. We're very fortunate to have Warren here tonight, but we're always looking for somebody. If you've collimated your RC, hey. Come on and, and you know set up your camera sometime and show us how you did it and all that other cool stuff, eh? And I, I actually uh, received an email about half an hour ago. Uh, how do I collimate an RC? You guys have to have a show, so that will be an upcoming show. Um, Great. I, it's one I've been planning on doing, but I'm kind of waiting for it to warm up a little bit because I'm going to have to spend a lot of time outside. Great. So and my RC is currently collimated, so I'm going to have to. Uh, mess up the collimation first, which is going to kill me. <laughs> so just an, as, an aside here, I, I had an image published in Astronomy Now UK, and uh, they kindly sent a uh, the issue. And first off, yeah, I was just so impressed with the format of it. I mean, sadly, it seems like our American magazines are, are, are getting smaller and, and, and thinner and cheaper. And having been published there in Astronomy Now and uh, Sky at Night, and also Chinese National As Astronomy, which unbel unbelievable, beautiful, heavy, glossy paper, fantastic prints of images and such. Um, I was, you know, I was really impressed. But I'm also sad, and uh, you know, I don't know if you guys uh, noticed the the latest Sky and Telescope. Uh, uh, in the middle of Richard Wright's article, has an AARP envelope silicone stuck in the middle of the thing and yeah. uh, non-astronomical advertisers so you know I mean we got to I guess do what we can to support these venerable publications um, otherwise I think they're gonna go away um, another thing I saw was really impressed with in that astronomy now was that uh, Starlight Express has uh, and uh, forgive me this old news but just introduced uh, you know, two large format cameras, 16803, and uh, and uh, looking really, really nice. Cool. So, any other Pix and Sight questions? I mean, again, I'm constantly blown away by how many people manage to go completely off track or never get on track, as evidenced now, as I said, by the latest. Uh, uh, group of newbies on the forum and although the forums a great place to ask questions and has some really great minds there it's important to know that there are some painless resources out there that puts this all together and it be it me or be it uh, K. Ron Mursika's, um, um what's the name of his um, uh, Davis Trap Photons another great resource uh, the Light Vortex Astronomy you know, he's a customer of mine. He learned from me, but he's a physicist, a physics teacher, and a very bright guy. And he's put out some really good tutorials. And you got, you know, even Harry Page's older tutorials. You got to be judicious. There are some really <laughs> bad information out there, but there's some people that are putting together really good information where you don't have to sit around like me and scan the forum every few days um, because there's always something new there. 
but uh, but but it, but you know, don't make it more painful than it needs to be. I mean, there's some very basic uh, principles that we need to understand. You know, uh, that we need to debayer before we register. That um, you know, these these simple gotchas uh, that uh, really get people discouraged. Awesome. He's, yep. Thank you, Warren. Um, Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I see we've hit uh, ten thirty-two, so we've gone through our uh, basically our, our typical hour. Um, the the other questions that I see popping up are somewhat unrelated, uh, so it might be I don't know. It might be a better topic to handle either in a forum. I don't think I can speak specifically to red circles that the HueTech LPS filter puts in your image. Um, which flats don't remove, I don't know. Uh, could be a number of things, and I don't think we have time to cover it today. Right. Uh, so that said, uh, all I'm gonna all I'm gonna say is thanks again to Warren. Um, <clears throat> thank you guys. Thank you, Adam. Thank you, Alex, and and everybody. No problem. Appreciate check it. check out uh, Warren's website, IP for AP, uh, or his uh, processing workshops. Like I said, I did put the links in the description on YouTube. Uh, you can click through from our website to find uh, to get there. You just click the little YouTube icon in the video, and it brings you there. Um, and that's uh, basically it. Um, again, thanks, thanks, guys, for watching. Uh, nothing specifically scheduled for next week, but something will be posted mid. Uh, mid next week. Thanks again. Good night. Thanks everybody. Good night.